Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Jeff Gumis and from Crowded Learning and today I'm excited to introduce, I'm just making sure this is recording because I often forget, perfect. Um, today we're going to be introducing the EdTech Makerspace, uh, which is a new initiative from Crowded Learning focused on helping educators learn how to use popular educational technology tools such as Quizlet, Kahoot, Wakelet and others, and in doing so, get practice using that tool while creating free and open education resources that can be used by other educators. Um, this is something I have been sort of threatening to do for some time now, and I'm really excited that we are about to get started on our first cohort. I'm gonna back up one slide real quickly. Um, actually, there we go. Um, if you want a copy of today's slides, the URL is there. I'm also going to paste it into the chat window. Um, this will be sent out following uh, this webinar a little bit later today, actually probably Monday, because I have a few things I want to make sure are, um, are fully done so that I'm not sending too many follow-up emails. But uh, the webinar slides will be sent out. A video recording of today's webinar as we're doing it right now, will be sent out as well as a Google form uh, inviting you to participate in the summer 2020 cohort of the EdTech Makerspace if you are so inclined after today's webinar. Yesterday, we had about 40 some odd folks um, and almost all of them were interested in participating in some way, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and uh, hopefully you are today as well. So this webinar should run about 45 minutes and the goal today is to really just introduce you to what it is that the EdTech Makerspace is. And we're actually going to work backwards. So we're going to start with sort of, what are we trying to create um, as part of this upcoming cohort? So we'll look at the content that we're going to be working with as part of the EdTech Makerspace and the tools that we're going to use to take that content and build additional engaging resources that supplement that content so that our end product will be a full set of resources that takes something that was great to begin with and makes it even better and all powered by adult educators such as yourself. Uh, then we'll just talk about why, why we're doing this, why it's important um, for us to be thinking about working collectively together and creating resources um, to just help adult education move forward with embracing and integrating high quality resources and educational technology as we face an uncertain future of whether or not we'll be um, in person or remote or an increased sort of combination of both because of some of the uncertainties that we have at the moment. And then finally, uh, we will do a walkthrough of what to expect with the EdTech Makerspace if you choose to participate. So walking through the process from sign up to how trainings will occur to how you uh, work and create content and how we can all work together to make this a supportive and hopefully fun process. Uh, and then we'll have time for some questions at the end. So I'm gonna actually uh, close my, uh, or stop my video so that my thumbnail is not in the way of the recording. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, introducing yourself. We have a great range of teachers from I think about 10 states now, if I'm not mistaken, um, or over 10 states, so that's exciting. So what is it that this EdTech Makerspace um, is planning to create? So the goal of the EdTech Makerspace is to take freely available content and enhance it by creating supporting tools using, um, using resources such as Kahoot, Quizlet, Google Forms, and, and others that we know are popular with adult educators to make it more digital, to make it more mobile friendly, and to provide more options for engaging learners with the content in ways that we know they can access. So the content that we're going to use for this first cohort, and I would say it's ambitious, um, is reading skills for today's adults. Now, many of you are probably familiar with reading skills for today's adults. It is an excellent resource that has um, 348 readings at early levels, and it is an openly licensed library of resources. So you'll see there's 16 levels, each of these levels has about 20 to 25 readings within it that are all lexiled at those levels. And it starts at early lexile levels. So I come from a publishing background 
and I worked for eight years in educational publishing for adult education, one of the things that we always heard from educators was we need more low level readings that are um, at the Lexia level that's appropriate for early readers, but that are contextualized for adults and that aren't childish. And that's a challenge um, to create. Uh, this library, Reading Skills for Today's Adults, was created by um, Southwest Minnesota Adult Basic Education, who saw the same need and decided ultimately to create their own library. The library is about 10 years old now, and they've done some recent updates to it to provide even more supporting resources that go with it, and that's the content that we're going to be working with. Uh, the nice thing about this uh, Reading Skills for Today as Adults is that there are audio recordings of every single one of the stories. There's actually three per story, and all of those are designed to model fluency for learners, whether or not they're working with a teacher or working independently just on the website. And as part of the update that Southwest Minnesota Adult Basic Education did recently to Reading Skills for Today as Adults, they add an activity supplement that not only supports the reading with things like comprehension questions that go along with it, but that also have vocabulary activities, grammar activities, speaking activities, uh, and writing practice that all deal with the story and all work in contexts related to the story. So it's a really, really great resource. Um, Again, the reason that I'm excited about using this resource in particular is it addresses a need that we know exists in terms of having um, readings that align to the appropriate levels for adult learners. And I actually, I forgot to update, the, these should actually be shrunk. Um, the readings are all at CCRS actually starting at level A, B, C, and some D. So these are at the earliest levels of Lexile as defined by the College and Career Readiness uh, Standards for Adult Education. And so, you know, there's again, 348 readings, but they're all focused on early levels as opposed to what we typically see, um, which are readings that tend to work for intermediate and higher level ABE students. Um, just one note, because many of you may be familiar with reading skills for today's adults, as I said, this site has been around for, I think, over a decade. Many of you may be familiar with and might even call it Marshall Adult Education because that's actually the individual organization that created the original library. And on the left, you can see that that is what um, that website looks like. If you Google reading skills for today's adults, that is the website that you're going to get. So I encourage you to make sure that you pay attention here. Um, this is the correct URL. It's reading skills for the number four today.com. And that is the website that has the updated readings with all of the various resources. So I'm actually going to hop into the reading skills for today's adults website so that you can see um, what it looks like. And again, this is what educators we know are using very widely. So as part of my work at Crowded Learning, uh, we're often polling teachers on what are the free resources that you're using. Khan Academy is always number one, but I would say that one of the more popular tools that we hear folks are using is reading skills for today's adults. So I'm going to look at this uh, story, Calling in Sick, but before I do, as I mentioned, and as the title suggests, these are stories designed for adult learners. So when you look at these titles, they're dealing with things such as work and safety, and nutrition, and parenting, uh, and health. So the, the topics within these stories are designed to, to deal with issues that adults deal with. Um, and so, sorry, I clicked on the wrong one, or maybe I didn't, perfect. Um, we're gonna go to, sorry, I gotta go back. Uh, I'm gonna go to Calling in Sick. And so this is the format of um, the content on the website. When I click on a story, I see the story here in the right-hand pane. And I also see these count word counts for each line. Um, that's because the resource itself was designed specifically to help learners develop their fluency skills. And so this is a word count per line, and you'll see there's a countdown timer here, so that if you click on start, the timer is going to start, and then a student can read. Um, and then wherever they get to in the reading, that's going to help them sort of understand their words per minute. 
Now, uh, fluency is one component of evidence-based reading instruction. And uh, speed, the speed with which someone reads, is obviously part of fluency, but it certainly is not the most important part. Uh, understanding how to read with the proper inflection, understanding how to chunk text appropriately to, to put in pauses where they're intended, and use intonation that, that uh, suggests that you, you comprehend the text because of the intonation that you use are all part of fluency. And so uh, to support that, every story has three recordings. And so what you'll see here is the recordings themselves go from one that's a minute 29 seconds to one that is 25 seconds shorter to one that's about 13 seconds shorter. Uh, and the reason for that is because each of these recordings is focused on supporting different elements of fluency. So for a second, I'm gonna play this first one. And gets ready for work. She puts on her clothes. So you'll see that this first reading, the reason it's longer, is it's literally focused on word by word decoding in a fluent manner within a larger body of text. There's not a lot of intonation, there's no chunking, it's just helping the learner hear each word and the proper pronunciation of each word. So it's almost decoding in some ways. Um, as opposed to, you know, fluently reading an entire text. The second reading, you'll notice, is going to be a little different. Holds her hair. Then she lies down on the couch. Lynn does not feel well. So you'll see this recording gets into more of the chunking of texts and putting in the appropriate pauses. And so it's helping that student understand sort of the pacing that one should read, particularly related to pausing when it's appropriate based on either punctuation or, or based on some of the words that are actually included in the text. And then the third reading actually is, is designed to, to model complete fluency. So with all of the proper prosody, intonation, fluency, chunking, all of that, um, and that's obviously why it is the shortest. And what you'll see on the left-hand side is a number of other resources that support the story. Now, if, if, if your students are like most students that I know, they're not necessarily downloading these and printing these out. So in often cases, that's something that would be a teacher driven act, right? Like where I'm gonna print out these for students. And I, I wanna make mention of the fact that those are there. I did see that someone's from, um, I believe, correctional settings. All of these stories have downloads that include pre-questions, um, post-questions, the story itself, uh, and then a supplement, which is actually what we're going to look at because it's this supplement that is the, is the, is the content that we're gonna be dealing with as part of the EdTech Makerspace. So if I go to this next slide, um, we're gonna see that supplement for the story we were just looking at. So for all 348 stories, as part of the revision of Reading Skills for Today's Adults, they developed a supplement. And what you'll see here is it starts with the vocabulary words from the story, and then there's two vocabulary activities. One is a vocabulary closed paragraph that, that mirrors the content in the story and has the students enter in those words. And then the second is a fill in the blank activity that uses these words as well with a word bank. And then we move to the next page of the supplement that includes language practice. Now this is using uh, common contractions because the story itself has some contractions within it. And so it gives examples of common contractions that we use in the English language, and then asks the students to use the proper contraction um, based on the, the full phrase um, that's intended for each of these sentences. Then they're asked to write two sentences that use common contractions in response to a prompt. And then there's a speaking activity uh, that is actually focused on comprehension, but through speaking. And so it gives sentence stems for students to, in terms of how to set up their, their oral response to each of these questions. Then there's a comprehension uh, assessment that, that follows a typical format of multiple choice. And then there's a writing activity that um, deals with the content of the story and has students reflect on it as, it as it relates to themselves. So connecting text to self, which is an important reading skill. And within that, they also provide sentence frames 
that um, will help support the, the learner in, in um, formatting and structuring their writing. So this is an amazing tool in itself. If we're talking about evidence-based reading instruction, it's great because it's looking at vocabulary, it's looking at comprehension, and obviously the, the online tools themselves help focus on fluency. But again, particularly if we're working remotely right now, students aren't necessarily going to be downloading the supplement and working through it, right? Um, and so the goal of the EdTech Makerspace is to take some of the activities within the supplement and make them more accessible to learners, whether or not a teacher is assigning them and make them available to learners to be able to practice in particular their vocabulary and their comprehension. And so for practicing the vocabulary, as we noted, um, the vocabulary words are listed at the start of this supplement. What we are going to do as part of the EdTech Makerspace is we're gonna learn how to use Quizlet and a lot of the ins and outs and some of the cool features that Quizlet offers. But then we're going to be creating Quizlets for the vocabulary from each of these stories so that learners can engage with the vocabulary in a variety of formats. Now, if you're familiar with Quizlet, this is what sort of the front page looks like when you get to a Quizlet. And I've intentionally um, shown an image that shows it from a mobile device uh, because we know that that's predominantly the tool that learners are using to um, access online activities. But for Quizlets, we'll see that there's a learning activity, there are flashcards, there's a writing activity, there's a matching activity that's sort of like concentration, um, and there's a test. Quizlet automatically adds audio for each of the words and the definitions, and it's strikingly good. It's automated audio, but it's, um, it's very good audio, uh, and is also available to be able to translate in multiple languages, and so it's a great resource. The other thing that's good about Quizlet um, is all of these are shareable. So if a teacher doesn't necessarily want to use what we create or wants to add to it or adjust it or do something to it, they have the ability to make a copy of the Quizlet for the story and then do whatever they want to it in terms of adjusting it. So the second activity from the supplement that we're going to be taking and building from are the comprehension assessment questions at the end. And so what we're going to learn is how to use Google Forms to create quizzes. Um, and there's a number of great features within Google Forms for using quizzes. And we know that it's a popular tool for um, assigning quizzes, particularly since we know that a lot of teachers have started moving more towards Google Classroom as the centralized hub, given that we're working increasingly remotely at the moment and potentially for a longer period of time. And so this is what a Google Forms quiz looks like. Again, it's extremely mobile friendly. And this provides learners with the opportunity to answer these questions on their own, to self-guide learning within the, the readings that are appropriate for them, and to see if they comprehend um, without a teacher necessarily having to assign anything. So what we're gonna do with Google Quizzes, uh, Google Forms, excuse me, is learn how to create questions. We're gonna learn how to weight those questions. We're gonna learn how to make them shareable. Um, a lot of people don't realize that you can uh, set a Google Quiz so that if someone clicks on a link, that they automatically get a copy of that quiz so that they're getting the information from that quiz as opposed to a lot of quizzes that are posted. Yes, the learner gets their response, um, but the teacher doesn't see the back end data. And so um, this will allow for folks to actually, um, to, for you to learn how to create uh, quizzes that can be copied by other educators, uh, as well as selecting a correct answer and providing answer feedback. So you're gonna learn all of those skills as you learn how to use Google Forms by creating quizzes for the assessments from these stories. So then the last tool that we're gonna learn how to use is it's great that suddenly through the work that we do, there's gonna be a vocabulary a study set with Quizlet, there's gonna be a Google Forms quiz that tests comprehension, and obviously the original story, but how are those things gonna be pulled together so that a student can access them all in one place as opposed to bouncing around to a bunch of different places. And we're going to use a tool called Wakelet that allows us to do that. Wakelet is a tool that allows you to pull videos, to pull uh, URLs and other things into one, what's called a collection. 
so that uh, students don't have to be going to different websites or entering in different URLs. The Wakelet provides a hub for your activity and you can put any of the links that you want students to be going to in that Wakelet. Wakelets are extremely shareable um, and we're going to look at what that looks like in a second so that students can um, uh, be able to, you can assign it through Google Classroom, you can assign it through Remind, you can assign it through Microsoft Teams, which is actually a, a tool and hub that some teachers have been moving towards in, in the midst of COVID. Um, or you can share them out as links in, in whatever format you share things out and then students can immediately access it. So I'm gonna stop for a second and take a poll because we're looking at five different resources now um, excuse me, four different resources now, no, five, no, four, I can count, <laughs> um, that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm interested in hearing from you. This is a poll that's now going to pop up on your screen. Please select all that apply. Which of these tools or resources have you used before um, or used to create resources? And we've got about uh, two thirds of you have answered. I'm gonna give it about one more minute, or not one more minute, about 20 more seconds, sorry. Um, so please vote if you haven't. This is really interesting to see. It's, it's on par with yesterday, um, more or less. All right, and I'm gonna close it in three, two, one. All right, we're gonna end the poll and I'll share the results. Um, so hopefully you can see the results on screen. What we're seeing is a number of you have used Google Forms, which is great because I actually think Google Forms um, is the most challenging of the tools in terms of making sure that, that we're, we're doing everything correctly before we create the resource. Um, so the fact that you, you have a background with Google Forms, or many of you do, um, will be helpful. But we will be looking at a number of different elements of each of these tools, even beyond what we're actually going to put into the resources we create. So we will be providing training um, that gets into some of the um, uh, cool and uh, interesting um, elements that you, you can do with each of these tools. Um, and a few of you use Wakelet, that's good, but Quizlet and Google Forms, uh, both yesterday and today, those were the two sort of more um, widely used resources by students. Someone asked a question, sorry if I missed it, can you give the range of grade levels this is appropriate for? The readings from Reading Skills for Today's Adults are lexiled at the earliest levels. So it's 348 readings that span from CCRS level A, which is the earliest level, all the way up to level D. Um, but a pr predominant number of the stories are at levels A, B, and C which are the uh, earliest levels. So grade level equivalency from literacy levels up to sixth, seventh, eighth grade, but more of them are sort of below sixth grade level. Um, so we're gonna move on. And so the result is going to be this Wakelet library and um, where it will be housed, learners and instructors will be able to access it via the Crowded Learning website. We're going to encourage Southwest Minnesota ABE to actually um, put it on their site as well. Um, and teachers will be able to share these with learners, as I said, in a variety of formats. So these, there's QR code share, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, Twitter, Remind, Reddit, and Facebook even. Um, so plenty of ways that these can be shared. And because Wakelet is designed for teachers to create and share, you'll be able to copy these collections, or any teacher will be able to copy our finished products, and then they can add in whatever they want. So this, you know, this story is about stress. It's a story about stress, but you could add a video about stress or coping with stress. You could add whatever you want to the Wakelet and really build out an even more rounded lesson, but using what's been created by us in the EdTech Makerspace as the basis, to, which includes obviously the vocabulary, the reading, and the comprehension question. So here are some stories that I've already worked with teachers to create, because we did do a little bit of a test run with some teachers here in Chicago to see how this works. But we'll go to the one for the story that we've already looked at some of the supplements, calling in sick. And this is what it looks like. 
I'm also going to uh, show you what it looks like on a mobile device, partly because I'm just super jazzed that I've learned of some new tools that allow us to share um, screencast uh, using our mobile device, which I know is important to learners. So basically you see we have um, calling in sick, there's an introduction and we're gonna follow the same format for all of the wakelets and even the tools within to make sure it's a, it's a consistent structure. One of the challenges that we know uh, that, that prevent folks from using free and open resources is they sometimes are all over the place, like you're picking a lesson here or a video there or reading here, and it's not consistent like a curriculum would be. And so our goal is to really make sure that all of these are built consistently with consistent introductions so that they all sort of follow a similar, the same format. And so teachers can be assured that it's a consistent resource. And what we see is we've got the vocabulary, we've got the reading selection, uh, and we've got the comprehension question. And at the bottom, we indicate, because this is openly licensed content, we're making sure to let folks know that the content that was used for this comes from reading skills for today's adults. And it's licensed in a certain way, which we're gonna, I'm gonna show you in a second what that means. Before I hop on into that, I am going to share my screen differently. Um, and just so you know, because this is literally something that I learned this week, is if you have an Apple device, you have the ability to share your screen um, and cast your phone into Zoom so that people can see your screen. So I'm doing that as we speak right now. I'm actually not sure what you see at the moment, but in a second, maybe this could, Zoom's been a little interesting. This is a new tool. In a second, you should be able to see my phone. Now I'm going to ask, can you see my phone? I'm going to ask that in the chat because it, it doesn't, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me know that you can't see the poll. And I'm going to share my screen differently. It doesn't seem to like if you hop from a Google Slides uh, to the phone. So I'm going to mirror my phone now. I think this will work better. Here we go. Can you see my screen now? And thank you for letting me know that the poll was still in the way. Perfect. Awesome. You guys are great. So this is uh, what you can do with Zoom. Now, well, you, oh, I got a notification from Starbucks. I thought I should shut off my notification. So one thing to be careful of if you're screencasting is that. Um, but I'm really excited that I discovered this because one of the things that we're trying to do is let folks know how to use these different apps. And it's really important uh, that, yes, we do all need a little Starbucks, thank you, uh, that we're able to model this with students. I literally put on Do Not Disturb and now everything's popping up, but I'm gonna go to Wakelet so you can see what this looks like um, from a student perspective. So it's interesting that people are saying they can still see the poll. Oh, interesting. There, I think I may have just gotten rid of it now, hopefully. Uh, this is what Wakelet looks like on a, um, oh my gosh, this poll is annoying. <laughs> um, oh, so I think you might have to hit close on your own screen, someone is saying, that you have to close it out yourself. Um, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So if you close out the poll yourself, obviously you wouldn't think that you could close something out in Zoom, but apparently... Um, it's up to you to close that poll so it's out of your way, and hopefully that um, worked for you. So I use Wakelet for all sorts of things. I create resource directories for teachers. I use it to create actually full-scale lessons. Um, I use it to guide uh, professional development. So if I know there's, a, like, I'll, I'll put the presentation slides, and if there's activities that I want teachers to do, I'll put those activities in the Wakelet so that they're, they can launch from that and I'm not having to share a bunch of different um, resources. But here's that same story, calling in sick. And I have a little bit different view because I own it um, as opposed to what a student would see. They wouldn't have a button here that says add an item. But this is what it looks like from a student perspective. So again, I've got the, an intro that's saying what it is, I have vocabulary practice with directions, I have a reading selection, and then I have comprehension questions. And so if I click on something like the Quizlet here, it's gonna launch that Quizlet. And the nice thing is it's launching the Quizlet in Wakelet. 
Um, and so basically they can work through these activities here and then just click on the X up here and um, it'll bring them back to the wakelet. So they're not hopping out into anything, although they do have the ability, if they were to click up here, to open it up into uh, a, another window if they wanted to. Um, but it's a really great, um, uh, wakelet is really great because it does, not only does it pull things together, but it keeps students in the wakelet, if you will, um, so that they're not bouncing out and getting confused by it. But this is the end product that we are going to be creating um, by way of the EdTech Makerspace. And I'm gonna stop sharing my phone and go back to the presentation. And here we go. So why are we doing this? Uh, well, first of all, um, we know that teachers are looking for more ways to share in particularly mobile content because of the fact that um, we're increasingly working in a, in a virtual or distance learning environment. And so we need more tools and we need more resources that are available that are easy to assign and easy for students to access. And in doing that, it's great if the tools exist, but we also want teachers to know how to use these tools effectively and not just use the available resources, but to be able to create their own resources if they want. Um, and in doing so, we're just putting more content that's out there, teachers are developing skills, and we're providing more ways for learners to engage with content, whether or not there's a teacher assigning it or, or they just want to provide students with access so that they can do self-study. One of the teachers yesterday asked, well, how, does, how would a learner know where to go? Um, what if I don't know the learner levels? And there are tools like uh, Read Theory that allow you to diagnose a student's um, Lexile level. And then once you know that information, like what if you know their TAB level or you, you know their Lexile level from a diagnostic such as um, using Read Theory, then you can tell the students exactly what set of stories are appropriate based on uh, their reading level at the moment. And then they, they have the ability to work through as many readings as they want. And again, they're, they're on topics that are, are relevant to adult learners. Um, another thing is, as I've mentioned already, we just wanna take something that's really good, the, the Reading Skills for Today's Adults uh, library, and to make it better. So by doing it and containing everything in a wakelet, it's easier to share these readings with learners. Uh, we're providing more engaging and mobile learning and mobile friendly learning options for students. And again, we're allowing for self-guided learning and by taking these resources and, and allowing them to be delivered in a way that students can engage with them without having the teacher have to print something out or, or assign it to them, not only are they getting the fluency practice that they'd be able to get as is with the website, but we're adding in, um, again, vocabulary practice that is interactive and accessible, mobile accessible, and comprehension practice um, that's interactive and mobile accessible. And so it just basically augments this library in a way that makes it more accessible to more learners. Uh, the other thing, and this is part of Crowded Learning's mission, is Reading Skills for Day as Adults is an openly licensed library. And what that means is they have set the permission uh, of their content and they've licensed it such that they invite educators to adjust it, to revise it, to add to it, and share it with others so long as educators are following some certain guidelines based on the license that they've um, used for the library. So attribution, this is the license that Reading Skills for Today's Adults is licensed under. And one of Crowded Learning's mission missions is also to make sure educators are aware of what open content is versus just free content. Um, so because they've put the buy in, that means anytime you use the content, you should be attributing them and just making fo letting folks be aware that it's not your content, that the content being used is from reading skills for today's adults. Now they did not put in this into their license because if this was in the license, then it actually isn't an openly licensed resource because this is saying you can't revise it and you can't change it, but that's not part of their license. And so this allows us to do so. They have put a share alike license, which means that for the Quizlets that we create or the Google Forms that we create or the Wakelet that pulls everything together, 
we need to make sure that we are also licensing those things using this same exact license because that is what reading March, or excuse me, Southwest Minnesota Adult Basic Education has said that if you're going to use this content, revise it and do something with it, that's fine, but you just need to repeat this license. You can't adjust the license. And then the fourth uh, icon that you would see on something that is Creative Commons licensed is non-commercial, that you're allowed to use it in whatever way you want, but you're not allowed to make money. And I just bring up that point because someone could simply license something as CC BY. I've actually licensed presentations as that. What that literally means is you could take my presentation and start making money as a presenter, professional developer, using my content, as long as you're attributing that the original content comes from me. Um, and so this is partly an exercise to help educators understand how to properly attribute an original source of content in a way that respects the original license and is the spirit of open education and open license. And then the fourth thing is this is the spirit of crowdsourcing that crowded learning is trying to work towards. Um, if we collectively work together and sort of focus on one thing to build together, suddenly everyone benefits from us creating something that is consistent, that is focused on something that we know is needed by educators and students, and that we're making available to everybody freely. And I am be over the moon excited if you follow Crowded Learning and maybe you know about Skillblocks. Skillblocks is a tool that we created that to help educators um, find math content by looking for specific skills and then being able to see what uh, lessons, activities from free and open education resources and from publishers align to that skill. And in the spirit of crowdsourcing, I was introduced to something that unbeknownst to me was happening in the state of South Carolina, where a teacher has been working through uh, the content of skill blocks, and they've literally created a line to each of the tape levels, uh, lessons and key codes that basically, uh, if I click on any of these, one teacher has created all of these. There's over 200 skill blocks that she has created. And now I can go to any of these and it will launch the skill block for this concept. So they've put in the books that, uh, that they, students have access to and indicated that, that indicates the page numbers that align to two digit edition. And then here are all these free resources from Math is Fun and one from FET that align to the concept of two digit edition. So one teacher, I think it might be more than one teacher, but I know one teacher has been leading it up and suddenly everyone has access to these skill blocks that provide the, the, the foundation for a bunch of different resources that align to a particular skill. And that's what we're trying to do at Crowded Learning is provide teachers with ways to do that and, and doing it in a way that if we do it in a specific manner, then everyone benefits from that work. So I want to use this last five minutes to walk through how the EdTech makerspace works. Um, and so just so you know this, there's a slide on this at the end, but our goal is to run this for six weeks from July 12th to, I don't know the end date, but it's somewhere in mid-August. And people can continue beyond if, if they need more time. But the goal is to have two week sort of sprints working in each of the tools. And so the steps that we'll be going through is signing up. There's a sign up form that I'll show you some of the snippets from in a second. And to indicate both your experience with these tools as well as your commitment level. So how many resources do you wanna to commit to creating? And part of that is just so we know how many people we can let in um, because we wanna give everyone the opportunity to create what they've committed to. Um, we will be issuing certificates and badges based on you know, whatever it is you commit to. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we can honor that. Uh, and then once you've signed up and said what you're going to do, um, we're gonna ask that you have to attend the required webinars, which will be tech tool trainings. Now, one of the things that we're putting in is the ability for you to skip the training if you want, if you have experience using that tool. So what we'll ask, and I'll show you in a second, is if you have experience, you feel you're proficient in, say, Quizlet, 
we just ask that you provide a sample. So in the, in the sign up form, we'll ask you to just share a URL of a Quizlet that you've created so that we, we have some level of, of awareness that, yeah, this person knows what they're doing. So you'll be able to skip the sort of how to's on the tool itself. Although, as I said, for every single one of these tools, we'll be diving into things that might be lesser known um, tips and tricks that you can do with that tool. But we will ask that you at least attend or watch the video that walks through how you're going to create the specific resource for this cohort. So we're in a very specific format that we want people to follow for the Quizlet, for the form, and for the Wakelet. And we do require that you at least um, watch that video or attend the period of the webinar uh, that focuses on that. And then you'll be creating your resources. Now we're going to follow a format of introducing the tool and the, the activity in terms of what you're going to be creating. We're going to be assigning and running everything through Google Classroom so you can indicate when you're done and we can track it that way. So added benefit, you're going to see from a student perspective how things go in Google Classroom when you're getting quote unquote assignments to one, sign up for the webinar and two, complete your resources. Um, we're also going to have uh, open office hours where you can work in a collaborative environment if you don't want to build these things on your own. And then finally, submit your resources. So the sign up form uh, is basically going to be uh, indicating your uh, experience with these tools, whether you use the tool all the time or you've never used this tool. So just letting us know because this helps us know how to tailor the trainings that we're going to do. And then as I said, documenting your proficiency. So if you know how to use a tool, I don't want you to waste your time having to sit through a training on something that you already know. And so uh, all we'll ask is you indicate your proficiency level, and then if you feel that you don't need the initial training on the tool, we'll just ask that you provide a URL for something that you've created, and then we can just see and verify that. We're not gonna be super sticklers on that, this is kind of honor system, but we just wanna be mindful of your uh, time um, because we know that you know, everyone's time is precious. And then we're gonna ask you to make your commitment. So there's three tools that we're gonna be learning how to use, Quizlet, Google Forms, and Wakelet. You may just be an expert at uh, Quizlet and you don't even wanna do the trainings, you just wanna volunteer to help make some Quizlets because it's something that you know how to do, it's a breeze. So we'll just ask that you commit to creating uh, 15 Quizlets. Um, and that's it, like that will be your entire commitment and then you can go forth. There'll be a sign up sheet for you to select the stories and the resources that you want. It'll be an open Google sheet. Um, and so you can just do that. Uh, or you may decide that you, you don't wanna learn all three tools, but you're, you've been really interested in learning how to use Wakelet. That's great. So you do the Wakelet training and then your commitment will be to create a certain number of wakelets. Now Quizlet will be 15 learning resources because of the fact that in the grand scheme of things, it's the easiest one to create. Um, and then for Wakelet and Google Forms, it'll be a lesser threshold if you're just doing that tool. Uh, but you also have the option to create five complete resource sets for five stories. So that would be creating the Quizlet, creating the form, creating the wakelet. Um, and that would involve you selecting, ideally, the three resources from one story. And the added bonus, if you do that, remember we're talking about attribution, um, what we'll invite you to do then is on the wakelet that you'll have the ability to say that this wakelet was created by you um, and is, has been created using content from you know, whoever. So again, getting some practice, understanding how to properly attribute, but we wanna give credit to teachers who have taken time to build um, these resources. And so, you know, we'll, we'll allow for that um, so that you're getting credit for the, the, the commitment that you're making to developing your skills, but also the commitment you're making to creating resources that other educators and learners can use. Um, and so basically, you'll attend, the, you'll get an assignment asking you to attend the training for the tools that you've selected that you wanna learn. Um, and again, it's a 90 minute webinar. The first portion, 60 minutes, will be diving into techniques and how to use the tool. And then the last half hour or 15 minutes really will be focused on the specific way in which we want you to create a Quizlet, a form or a Wakelet for the assignment that you'll be getting, getting excuse me. And then you'll be creating your resources. So again, 
will be a signing that it's time once we know that you've attended to create the resource. Um, and all you'll do is once you've done your resources, you're going to be pasting your URLs into a shared doc and then you'll just uh, mark as done when you're finished to indicate that you're finished. When you're given the assignment to create the resource, you'll be given a video that walks through the steps. You'll be given a guide that shows exactly how we want the, the Quizlet, in this case, created for these reading skills for today's adult stories. And you'll also be given links to models of the finished product so that you'll see what it is you're aiming to create for the stories that you've selected. Um, and as I said earlier, if the format that we're gonna follow is very early in week one of each sprint, you will learn how to use the tool through the webinar. And then at the tail end of that week, we will offer an open office hour for you to work um, using Google Meet in an environment uh, where you can ask questions of other teachers or me um, and build alongside others so that um, you can be in a collaborative space as you're doing so. And then we'll offer that again early in the second week. So for each tool, we intend to have two open office hours for you to be able to ask questions in real time of other educators or of myself. Um, within that, uh, we do want to offer volunteer opportunities for, for folks. Now, obviously, this whole thing is, in a, in a sense, a volunteer opportunity, but you are, you know, it's designed for you to learn new skills. However, if you're really proficient in one of these tools, we would love for folks to offer up being a virtual tutor, um, which would mean that hopefully you can attend one of the open office hours to support other educators and answering questions as well as monitor the chat, uh, the stream within Google Classroom to answer questions that folks might pose. If you really are confident in your skills and wanna share the super cool ways that you use Wakelet Forms or Quizlet, um, we would love to have you present during the training portion so that not only is it sort of mundane how to use this tool, but we're hearing from educators in terms of how they're using the tool. And if you don't feel really confident in your proficiency on any of these tools, but you wanna help out, we're definitely going to be looking for reviewers. And the reviewer's job is going to be to basically, um, once folks have submitted and say, I'm done with, with the resource they've created, the reviewer's job will be to basically just look at the re resource, make sure the link is correct, make sure the words that are in there are correct, make sure that it's been attributed correctly, and then sign off and say it's done so that there's a level of quality control that we're all working towards. Um, and so then we know that those resources are ready to then ultimately get put into um, the Wakelet as well as into the library of resources that teachers will have available to them. Uh, and then these are the dates that we're looking at. So two week sprints uh, starting July 13th for each of the tools and then indefinitely ending um, the 21st with Wakelet. But again, there's no real time crunch, although hopefully um, we can get this done. It would be awesome if uh, we have the full library um, completed by the start of September, um, because that for many is the start of school year and suddenly we've put forth an awesome set of resources for teachers um, to begin using. So I'm gonna open up one more poll um, and I am going to go to your interest levels and I'm gonna launch the poll. So I'm just asking, um, we are going to be promoting this widely uh, for the next few weeks in advance of sign up. Uh, but I just want to know what your interest level is in, you can select multiple, uh, volunteering um, in learning and creating resources with just one tool uh, or learning and creating resources using all three tools. And so I'll leave this up for about 20 more seconds. Cool, thank you. We've got about two thirds have indicated and that's awesome to see that many of you are interested in participating. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, I'm gonna end the poll because I know we're a little beyond time. So here are the results. Um, awesome, so like literally, if we just look at say 16 folks are interested in creating all three, right? Uh, times five, 
uh, if you're making the minimum commitment, that is 90 stories uh, fully done. And we had um, yesterday about 40 folks that had committed, so that's 200. So literally between these two webinars, um, if folks ultimately decide to commit, we've pretty much hit uh, creating all of the resources that are needed to fully take the Reading Skills for Today's Adults library and create these resources so that we have a full library of um, content uh, that uses all of these tools. So I want to open it up to questions. You guys have all been pretty quiet. Awesome, so someone asked the very same question as yesterday and I need to sort of scroll up. So someone asked, are we able to use quizzes instead of Quizlet? And it's a great question and the answer is no. And <laughs> here's the reason for that. One of the things that we know is like folks, uh, as you've been learning, I'm sure in working virtually, is it's we want to commit to a single tool. Um, and so what, what we'll have here is very consistent format for every single one of these things. Now that doesn't mat mean that if you as a teacher want to take uh, the Wakelet and create a Quizlet, and, or quizzes, excuse me, instead of a Quizlet um, for the story, that you can't swap that out and then have your own Wakelet. Like that is something that you're perfectly able to do. The other thing I forgot to mention is we will be posting and making available to teachers all of the individual links to all of these individual assets and inviting folks to add to it. So um, if, if you wanna create quizzes and you want to add it to sort of the, the master resource list of URLs, um, you're welcome to do so. But we, we need to sort of make sure that we're streamlining and making these consistent. And over time, if there's this overwhelming need to create quizzes, then a future ed tech makerspace um, could be run where we just take the same stories and we do quizzes versions of them as opposed to Quizlet versions. So um, we, we wanna stick to the set of tools for this, but um, as demand happens, if, if we decide to add, uh, we will. But we'll definitely be doing a future cohort with some content using quizzes um, because we wanna give teachers experience using quizzes and we wanna, again, create consistent content that's um, made available to you. Do, do, do. Where can we find the page uh, the South Carolina teacher did for uh, skill blocks? Uh, I'll paste it in the chat and I will also, um, you will get this presentation as a follow up. And in doing so, um, the, the, the image on that slide, I don't know why this isn't letting me click in the chat. It's because my thing is in the way. Um, there's the link to the South Carolina site that's on screen. Um, in the slide presentation that you'll get, uh, that that link is is in here as well. So this little image is, as you can see, it's linked uh, to that website. So if you're interested in seeing that, that's great. Uh, are there any other questions? If you asked it earlier, um, I wouldn't mind you asking it again, but it doesn't look like as I scan up. So any other questions from folks? If not, we will end this. Um, awesome. So I will be sharing all of these out again, probably Monday, the slides, the recording of today's webinar, as well as the, um, the Google form invitation to sign up. I encourage you to share this with other educators who might be interested. Um, we will do an optional uh, launch for those who maybe didn't attend a webinar, have expressed interest, but might not be certain of what this is, just to sort of walk through again uh, for participants that have signed up, um, how it's going to work. And thank you so much for your interest and in taking time on a Thursday morning. Have a great day.